What's chirping crickets? This is Kim from Kim Takes On, and I'd like to introduce my producer, Terrence the Wonder Duck. We decided to give him a promotion because he does so much work around here trying to keep me on the straight and narrow. So, this week is part of a two part series that I'm going to be doing talking about the king of rock and roll, Elvis Presley. Now, um, I was an Elvis fan. I still am an Elvis fan. Um, and it's really weird because Elvis was one of those parts of my life that was always part of my life. It's like Star Trek. Star Trek was always there in my life at one point or another. You know, from when I was a little kid, you know, till now. I just remember growing up with the reruns and all that stuff like that in the movies and all the things that have come along since. And that was the same with Elvis Presley. I heard the, I heard his music and, you know, on the radio and stuff like that. I had some albums of his. I, I had one of the albums that was his concert from Hawaii. And um, it's really crazy how some people can talk about and remember, you know, where they were when this thing happened or that thing happened, you know, whatever big event, you know, or the passing of a person. And I remember where I was on August 16th, 1977, when I got the news that Elvis Presley had died. I was in the, I was in the car with my mom and I'm pretty sure we were going to my grandmother's house and it came over the radio that Elvis Presley had died. And I kind of checked out for a minute. I just, I don't know where I went, but I was not there anymore. I was just kind of like sitting there staring straight ahead like that. What? That they didn't really just say that, right? That's, you know, it was just this weird moment. And my mom being my mom, little sidetrack. My mom was one of the greatest ladies I've ever known in my life one of the most wonderful human beings I've ever met. I might be biased, but I don't care. And she was one of those people that she always had a kind word to say about whoever, even if they didn't deserve it. And if they really didn't deserve it, she wouldn't say anything at all. But I remember her saying like, oh, that's a shame. He was so talented and all this stuff like that. And then I remember her kind of being like, are you okay? And I was just like, did they really just say Elvis died? And she was like, yes, they did. And that was surreal to me, you know? It was weird because there's certain people when they pass from this plane of existence into whatever is beyond this plane of existence, when they go, you're like, what? They, they can't be gone. They've been here forever. How can they be gone? You know, and that's how I felt about Elvis. Weirdly enough, that's also how I felt about Stan Lee. I don't know what that says, but anyway. Um, you know, just those people that are always part of your life, you know, and then when they're not part of your life anymore, there's like this big chasm that opens up and you're like, what do I do now? You know, it's really strange. It's also really strange because... Um, this is going to sound this is going to sound morbid and I don't mean it to. But I think that Elvis Presley was the the subject of the first picture that I had ever seen of a corpse. Um at the time Elvis had had died, I'd never been to a funeral or anything like that. Um so I I was still, you know, quite young and 
anytime there was a funeral, it was, you know, oh, the kids are too young for that, you know, let have them stay home, you know, stay with the babysitter or whatever. Um, and I remember seeing a picture of Elvis on the cover of the National Enquirer uh, back when the National Enquirer was a black and white uh, newspaper kind of a deal. Not, it wasn't all splashy color stuff. And they had a photograph of him in his coffin. And I remember being in a store, like a small store, not a big supermarket kind of a deal. And I remember just kind of standing there and, and just kind of staring. I mean, with this kind of dog hearing a strange noise, head tilt kind of, you know, cause you always hear people talk about, you know, when someone passes away, if you go to the, the wake or the funeral or whatever, you know, there are people are always like, Oh, he looked, he looks so peaceful. Oh, she looks like she's sleeping, blah, blah, blah. And all this stuff like that. And I just remember thinking to myself, that doesn't look real. That doesn't look like, a real person, you know, because not to get metaphysical or anything like that. And I know some people are already going, Oh crap, here we go. You know, cause here we go with Kim being hippy dippy trippy transcendentalist and all that stuff like that. But you know, you can call it a soul. You can call it, you know, energy. You can call it whatever you want, you know? Um, but I, you, you just look at, well, I remember looking at the picture of him and thinking that's not, that's a shell. It, it's, you know, the, the, what gave that form life is gone. And it's so weird to think about. And especially it's very weird because like I said, I was pretty young and I was thinking this stuff. I'm like, okay, so I've been a freak pretty much all my life. Hooray. You know, <laughs> I don't know. My, my brain goes weird places. It, it always has. It's always been a thing with me. The thing is, of course, in the rest of the world, you know, was coping with, with the death of Elvis or not coping. We'll get to that in a minute. Um, but I remember watching the news um, and seeing, you know, it was weird to me to see grown men and women crying. That was, you know, this is back in the seventies. Men didn't cry unless something heavy fell on them. You know, um, uh, I mean, we were in the whole seventies sensitive male era, but I don't think that made it to Massachusetts, whatever. But, you know, I remember seeing these people outside of Graceland, you know, and they're holding, people are holding each other up because they're so racked with grief. They can't stand properly. And just seeing women just sobbing their hearts out and seeing men try to be stoic and, you know, seeing these, the, the cars just so full to bursting of flowers and all this stuff like that. And it says a lot about a person how people act once they're once they're it, once people are grieving for them, and the amount of love that was shown and the amount of grief and pain that was shown when Elvis died. I'd never seen that before. I was I wasn't even born when JFK was shot, which is the last time I can remember seeing. I've seen videos of the funeral and such since then, and you know that that outpouring of of somber grief. Um, it was very different with Elvis. That was that was raw pain, you know, and it was it was really difficult to watch, you know? Um, and then after Elvis, I mean, the thing is the one thing that people, people get this wrong a lot when it comes to the whole concept of Elvis impersonators, there were people impersonating Elvis before he passed away and Elvis knew about it. I think for the most part, he got a kick out of it. 
I think he kind of fe- I think he kind of viewed it as you know imitation is the sincerest form of flattery, and nobody was trying to say they were Elvis because nobody could. I mean, we'll get to that later too. But you had all these people who were impersonating Elvis now, and after he passed, of course, then it went absolutely, you know, balls to the wall. And you had Elvis impersonators who really looked like Elvis at certain points in his life. You know, um, you had the, the people who would dress as Elvis when he was a young man and doing movies and stuff like that. And then you had the jumpsuit Elvis. And that is how I will be referring to him. I will not be referring to him in regards to his weight because that is body shaming and it's rude. I don't try to be militant on my show. I don't try and climb on soapboxes on my show. And I know Terrence is giving me the hairy eyeball right now, but that's all I'm going to do. I'm going to call that period the jumpsuit, Elvis. And if you have a problem with that, I'm sorry. Find a little more compassion in your heart. There. Sorry. Okay. All right. All right. All right. I'm not going to lecture anymore. But... You had people, you know, doing various stages of Elvis's musical career. And that's awesome. And, you know, some people could really sing very well. And some of them tried very hard. Bless their hearts. Um, You know, I mean, not everybody was going to sing exactly like Elvis because... I think people's singing styles are like fingerprints. You could be as close as possible to somebody if you really, really practice or if you're seriously that wicked talented. I'm not saying it can't happen. But to be exactly pitch perfect like another human being, um, no. Unless they invent cloning and perfect cloning and um, don't do that, please, Any. I mean, we've cloned sheep and other stuff, and that's great and fantastic and yay science and stuff like that. No, Terrence, we can't have somebody clone you a nice lady duck. I keep telling you, go go on plentyofducks.com. He's very shy. Um, But just the whole cloning thing creeps me out. Anyway, moving forward. Um, And the whole Elvis impersonator thing could... I don't know how to say this and not come off unkind. I'm not trying to come off unkind for a change. Yes, Terrence, thank you for that. Um, Boy, somebody took their sassy juice this morning, didn't they? Hmm. Um, But some people really did try to look like Elvis, and some people bought a jumpsuit. I am not saying that You know, people who didn't look like Elvis physically should never have been Elvis impersonators. I would never say that. I would never, never, never discourage anybody from their dreams. I would never do that. That's a terrible thing to do. It's just some people who have tried their hand at impersonating Elvis. Again, I'm doing the dog hearing a strange noise head tilt. I mean... It's just one of those things. But as the years went on after Elvis passed, you started hearing some weird stuff. And it was stuff that I was completely like, huh? You know, you started hearing people say, and they weren't saying it in a facetious way, and they weren't saying it in an ironic way, because being a hipster hasn't been invented yet. Thank whichever deity you pray to. Um, But there were people out there who believed, or at least purported to believe, put it that way, that Elvis had not really died that Elvis, in fact, had faked his own death um, for various and sundry reasons. Um, Most reasons I've seen from people who ask why the hell would he do this is, you know, people people who, you know, ascribe to some of these theories say things like, you know, well, he was tired of being famous 
and he was tired of people always following him around and, you know, the paparazzi and the press and the fans. And he was just a country boy at heart and wanted to go back to being a simple, regular person and not be Elvis Presley in, you know, nine foot tall letters. Uh huh. Okay. So the best way to do that wouldn't be to buy a private island or something like that. That would be to fake your death. Wow. Because um, I think probably money-wise at the time, Elvis probably could have bought himself a private island. I don't know. Um, wouldn't have shocked me. Um, but there were people, and the people were serious about this. People were not, like, this wasn't a joke. People really did believe that the body that was photographed was a wax figure that, you know, oh, there's all these clues that Elvis left that he's really alive. Like his middle name on his gravestone is spelled wrong. That's a clue. No, it isn't. Settle down, Sherlock. Somebody made a mistake. We're all human. It happens. But this really kept going. This was not just one or two people with this theory there were quite a few people with this theory to the point that it even got brought up in a movie called Bubba Hotep with Bruce Campbell playing an Elvis living in a nursing home with a gentleman who says that he's JFK played by Ozzy Davis and there's a mummy involved and I don't I don't want to talk about this anymore um but I do have an actual story what I can tell about this whole is Elvis alive situation that happened where I worked at the time. Sorry, my hair's kind of fly away, but it's hot up here and I need a fan on. Um, back in the late eighties, I worked in a bookstore. And um, for those of you who don't remember what that is, a bookstore is a place where you used to go to get things that aren't on Kindle or Nooks. And you actually would walk around and buy books that you actually held in your hot little hands and magazines and we sold cards and other stuff and what have you. I know I'm being really sarcastic. I'm sorry. So anyway, now, although I worked in this bookstore and I tried my best and was, I think I was a pretty good worker and I, you know, did my job and, you know, tried to be helpful to people and stuff. I had no control over the kind of stuff that we should, that we had no control over the magazines that were sold, no control over the books that were bought, so on and so forth. So one day I come into work all ready for my shift do to do to do. And I go to the counter and on the counter is a little box. Now we, we had things at the counter that, the way our the way our store was set up was the the um I know y'all really care about this look into my life but the the cash register and everything was on a little platform so we could look out over the store and such because it wasn't a great big store and that's where we had cigarettes and lottery tickets and stuff like that and we also had we'd have little displays sometimes for seasonal things um, or a special kind of whatever that the store wanted us to sell. So, so we get this little box thing and there's about half a dozen books in it and it's a package deal. It's a paperback book also with a little tape included, a little cassette tape. It's not an eight track, calm down. And if you don't know what an eight track is, ask your parents and shut up. I know that was not nice. Okay. So anyway, so I picked up the book cause I'm like, Oh, I wonder what this is. And I pick it up and on the front of the book, it says, is Elvis alive? And underneath it was all this talk about what was on the tape, which was stuff purporting to be people talking about Elvis and maybe even people talking to Elvis and all this stuff that are talking about him. I forget. It's been a long time. And I just remember kind of looking at it and being like, you've got to be kidding me. I mean, I was like, okay. So I put it back 
maneuvered the box back. And there the thing sat every day. And every day when I would come into work, at least once my sh once during my shift, I would have the unseen conversation with a customer. Because a customer would walk up with their purchases and they'd put them on a the little counter and I'd start ringing things up. And inevitably, somebody would look over at the book. They'd look over at it. Sometimes they'd pick it up. They'd pick it up. They'd look at it. They look at me with this look on their face like, are they serious? And I would just do this. And they would put it back. We'd finish the purchase. I'd give them their, their, you know, whatever they bought and they'd walk out. The whole time I was there, I never sold one of those books. Um, I don't know what that says. I don't know if people in Massachusetts are a little more suspicious of things like that. Yankee thrift. I don't know. I was just kind of like, wow. But it's something that I really got to thinking about. Why were people so desperate to believe Elvis Presley was not dead? And more to the point, if it turned out that Elvis was not dead and somebody found this out, I'm like, what would people's reaction be if it turned out that he that he had done this, that this was all some big subterfuge and he'd faked his death and all this stuff like that? I'm like, I don't know if most people would be like strewning rose petals in front of him and being like, oh, you've come back to us. I think most people would be pissed off unless they were diehard Elvis fans. I don't know. But why people can't let go or couldn't let go. I don't know if this stuff is still going on. I kind of think it isn't, but, um, I don't know. I really, I think it's just because it was so sudden. I mean, people knew that he wasn't doing great. I mean, people who had seen him recently before he passed had noticed that he had gained a lot of weight. It wasn't exactly a secret that he was, given medication that he probably shouldn't have been, you know? Um, but when you are Elvis Presley, you're not going to, you know, you're Elvis Presley at that point in your life. People are not going to say no because you're Elvis Presley. Um, and I, I don't know, maybe because it was the suddenness of it, maybe because people just couldn't, wrap their minds around someone who had been part of their lives for so long was gone. And just, I really don't know. I mean, I've never been able to ask anybody who, who really did believe that he was alive, you know, what their reasons were. Maybe it was just the idea of holding on to something from their youth and knowing someone from their youth was gone and, Maybe that makes you realize how fleeting life really is. I really don't know. Um, any theories that you guys have, PlatinumRoselle at Yahoo.com. Uh, next week, I'm going to be doing part two of this uh, little series here. Because next week, I'm going to be looking at someone who was a very talented musician in his own right. And added a really interesting wrinkle into all of the talk about the truth about Elvis Presley. Next week, I will be looking at a gentleman who was known to the world as Orion. So hopefully you'll come back next week and hear my talk about Orion and his career. Until then... I'm Kim, this is still Terrence the Wonder Duck, and we both hope you have an amazing day. Bye.